Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. We've got some slides there. It's our new series, Kingdom People, Finding Our Vocation and picking up on how we're blessed to be a blessing, that actually God blesses us as his people, but uh, it's not for us just to absorb all those blessings and just to become blessed by them, but to also bless other people, to take that joy, peace, and righteousness out to other people as well. So pretty much summed up by our banners here, that as you come into this place, we're praying that uh, you would have everything that you need in life for you, that you would be provided for, you'd have finances, that you'd have everything that you need uh, to bless other people. And then for us, as we go out from here, we're looking to be outward-looking people, looking for those that we can bless uh, by our lives through the kingdom. The kingdom is bringing God's rule into people's lives and setting them free from anything that they, uh, that might be holding them back in life. So it can be summed up with those things, kind of peace, joy, fulfillment, a sense of um, purpose in life. You know, where are we going uh, with our lives? What, what are our lives for? What is the purpose of them? And so this sense of vocation, what is uh, our lives all about? That's something we're going to be exploring over the coming weeks. Uh, I was provided with a dictionary definition of vocation. A calling to follow a particular activity, career, or profession. A strong inclination or inner urge to pursue an activity or perform a service. Or thirdly, a divine call to a particular function or station within a spiritual life. And there are some jobs that are vocational, aren't there? But the whole of our lives is a sense of calling about them, that these are the things that God wants us to live out. You know, um, for me and quite a few of us in the church, the last couple of years we've been spending a lot of time thinking about the rough sleepers in town. There's about 30 rough sleepers in town. And uh, this month we, we gathered as, as a church we led, gathering together all of the business leaders, council leaders, uh, to think about how we could better serve the rough sleepers uh, in town. And then this week, uh, just this week, we gathered all the church leaders in town. There was 22 uh, church leaders from the city centre to say, is there anything else we could do about the rough sleepers in town? And I'll be honest with you, I question myself. I think, is this what I'm supposed to be doing with my time? I don't know what you think. You may disagree, Paul. You should do something more useful. Uh, and the question was raised within there. Well, we're only talking about 30 people. You know, there's 250,000 people in the city. Is this the best use of their time to do a big project around 30 people? I then think to myself, you know, is this what I'm supposed to do? And a lot of church leaders don't gather together civic leaders, don't gather together church leaders to look at problems. They just get on with preparing their sermons properly for a Sunday. Uh, And they do things like that. They look after people. And I don't do uh, as much on that stuff. So am I doing the right thing, spending my time, a lot of my time, and other people in the church as well, thinking about these 30 rough sleepers? And... um, and I'm always thinking, am I, am I just, have I just got distracted by something I've read in a newspaper? Am I just pursuing something because I read it on the front page of a paper? Or am I doing it because this is what God wants me to do? I don't know if you have these sort of dilemmas with, with your life. Should I help this person or should I do that? Should I help this or do that? Do you get those sort of dilemmas in life? You know, where do, where do I put my energy and time? Because I can put all my energy and time in there and I can do a great job, but I could have been doing something else, couldn't I? And so, this is the word that came up. Thanks for moving me on. (laughs) Unbelievable. So, uh, we went to a conference last month, and it was an American guy, a prophetic guy, who hears from God and speaks uh, speaks from God to you. Uh, So it's a gift to the church. And he said this. I was um, was wearing sort of jeans and T-shirt, and he said, I saw you in a suit and tie, which I'm normally in a suit and tie, because I'm often talking to the council people uh, about stuff. And he said, big smile on your face. And you're going into boardrooms and you're passing by the homeless. Something was happening and something from the boardroom was going to the homeless and you were taking something from the homeless back to the boardroom. And it was a very confirming word from this guy, Wayne Drain, who we've had here in the church before. We respect him. And it just affirmed to me, yeah, I am doing the right thing. I'm spending my time and energy trying to care for these 30 people with all the investments around. I'm doing, God's happy that I'm doing that with my time because I was doubting myself. So what I want to spend a bit of time this evening thinking about is how do we discern what God's plan is for our life? You know, the basics of Christianity is God loves you 
and he's got an amazing plan for your life. If he just wanted to love you, he could just, you know, as soon as you say, yeah, I love you too, he could beam you up into heaven, couldn't he? And you could spend forever with him up there. But he wants us to have a purpose here on earth to bring his kingdom into earth. So he wants us to be loved, but also to take that out to other people. So how do we discern what God's will is for us? And then we might think, well, it's okay for superstars in the Christian world. They've got things to do. But for me, I'm too broken by life to be able to give anything to anyone. And I want to try and look at that. We might also think, well, I'm good, but I'm oppressed. Sometimes people just don't recognize how good I am. How many of you feel like that? (laughs) Just me. (laughs) We can feel like we're just squashed down. We're not given the opportunities that we're needed Thirdly, we might be really gifted and we might know that God's blessed us, but we can, as we talked about at the start, just use that for our own purposes. Just use that for our own blessing and not bless other people. We can forget about God and and forget about all the good things he's given us and just get on with our own lives and make the most of whatever we want. So there's three types of things I want to look at and we'll chat about those together. So here's our key verse, thank you, which is from Ephesians which just points out this very simple thing that we were made by God for a purpose. So the key verse for tonight, throughout the coming ages, we will be the visible display of the infinite, limitless riches of his grace and kindness, which was showered upon us in Jesus Christ. So just like Dan was saying, if people are going to see the kingdom, it's when they see us walk into the room, when we do things. That's what it's saying in that first verse. For it was... It was only through this wonderful grace that we believed in him. Nothing we did could ever earn this salvation, for it was the gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ, so that no one will ever be able to boast, for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. We have become his poetry. Say that together. We have become his poetry. (laughs) A recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. It's great news, isn't it? For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. So back to that basic news of Christianity. God loves us. He has an amazing plan for our lives. It's exactly what it says here, isn't it? God's grace is lavished upon us. And then secondly, he's prepared good works for us to do. So what we're going to look at tonight is, do we know what those good works are? And how do we find out what they are? Uh, Mark Twain, keep up with me, said, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And for us, like this, this night and this series is all about knowing why we've been, place where we are, in the time and place we are, what God has purposed for us, and trusting, even through good times and bad times, that actually God has a plan for us that he's working out day by day. And he's unfolding before us as we go through life. Uh, I wanted to tell you a quick story, um, which I've been fascinated by this week. It was this time last year, 17th of April, uh, 1918, that this lady, Tammy Jo Schultz, uh, was in the news. But before she was in the news for that, she was one of the first female Navy aircraft fighter jet pilots for the American Navy. And she was called out to Operation Desert Storm, to serve out there back in the 1990s. So she went out with all of her colleagues, most of whom, the majority of whom were men. And uh, guess what? The rule at that time was only men could fight in combat. No women. So she went all the way out from America to Iraq to be told, you can't take part in this mission because you're a woman. She's a really good pilot. So every mission that came up, she said, can I do this one? And they said, no. Can I do this one? No. In the end, they gave her this job uh, because they got bored of her asking to volunteer for the combat missions. They said, Tammy, Joe, would you do this? Here's the mission we'd like you to do. All of our pilots, they don't know what to do if they get into a crash. So we want you to train them uh, what happens if they go into uh, all sorts of crashes. So that was her job. So for six months in Iraq, rather than at home in America, she spent six months every day. She'd had a male pilot in her fighter jet And her job was to teach them how to survive when they were shot down. So she would put the plane into a spin or into a dive. 
And then the male pilot should be coaching them how to survive. It's a bit ironic, isn't it, that she's training them how to fight in a combat that she can't actually take part in herself because she's a woman. But she trains these guys, okay, when you're going to tell when this is what you're doing. Every time, she's calmly explaining, this is what you do, this is how you get out of it. And she does that day after day after day uh, for, for six months. Then last year, she, she's now a jet pilot, so she, she's in a like, passenger passenger plane. So she was flying a Boeing 737 from New York to Dallas this time last year. And she took off and got up to 30,000 feet. Then at 30,000 feet, the jet plane has got two main engines, left engine, right engine. The left engine blew up, completely dissolved. And then bits went everywhere, fuselage went everywhere, rotors went everywhere. The passenger window was blown out. All of the air in the cabins was sucked out, so the whole place was uh, decompressed. And because one engine's gone and the other engine's still going, what's going to happen to the plane is it goes into this spin. So when it's spooning, and then because you've got height from this side and not from that side, the plane dropped 40 degrees, like this. And it spun round, and then it dropped massively because it's got no power. This is the plane. 1380, flight 1380, that is Tammy Jo uh, there flying the plane. This is the engine, completely blown out. When the engine blew out, the window broke through and a passenger was sucked up to the window. It's horrific. 149 people on board and this one passenger was right by where the engine blew out. So then this is what happened. Tammy Jo, as you know, she's pretty good in a crisis because she spent six months against her will. It's the last thing she wanted to do. But if there was anyone who was good in a crash, it was her. So this is what happened. And the audio is still available. And you'll hear, if you ever want to listen to it, how calm she is. Explain to everyone on board. The first thing you need to do to her crew is to take hold of your oxygen mask and put it on. Because if you don't breathe you die. So this happens. So they all put the oxygen masks on. Meanwhile, the plane is dropping. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been through turbulence, but the whole plane is shaking like this. There's noise everywhere, people screaming. But she calmly then says to the flight attendants, you need to get the portable uh, oxygen mask, the work your way down through the, cr- down through the passages, make sure everyone's got their oxygen on board. They do that. Then they, they explain there's this one passenger who's badly injured through this. So she says, well, the next thing you need to do is start CPR on this person. Meanwhile, while she's still trying to pull the plane up, this is all happening in seconds, she, she tries to work out which airport to land in. And the ground crew was saying, this is your nearest airport. But she worked out in her head that the best emergency services were at Philadelphia. She said, no, I want to go to Philadelphia. We can make it there in time. So she does that. And then she says, these are the emergency vehicles I need in place when I crash this plane in Philadelphia. <laughs> so all this is happening in seconds. And so she calmly brings the plane down. She has to change uh, tack all the time, depending on what's happening with this passenger that's injured and so on. And then she safely brings the plane down. Here's the facts around it. The plane plunged 8,000 feet in two minutes, then 13,000 over the next five minutes. So these seven minutes, she was calm, about, calm as anything. What I forgot to say to you is, she's a Christian. She's a follower of God. In fact, when she talks about this, she talked about it at the um, US prayer breakfast earlier this year. She said to the air crew, but before she got on, she said, this is the psalm and the proverb that I read this morning. And she shared scripture with them, with the flight crew. The flight crew said after this, as soon as they heard her voice coming through on the tannoy, telling them what to do about the oxygen mask and everything else, they felt completely at peace throughout this whole experience. Hard to believe that anyone could be at peace in this terrible seven minutes. And she said, there's a quote there, you probably read it already, I think God gives us a calm when we need it. Schultz says, I mean, as parents, whenever there's a bad cut or a broken bone, you don't go all emotional. You keep calm because your child's watching your face. But the little thing about this story is she thought she was in the wrong place in, in Desert Storm, didn't she? She thought she was being served up a cruel blow in life to be somewhere where she couldn't use her gifts to the best. But in fact, 
it was the right place for her to be. And if it hadn't been for her, all of those passengers on the plane, the one by the window died, sadly, days afterwards because of the injuries. But everyone else, 148 people on the plane, survived this crash. She was praised by the US president. She was given uh, awards and so on. But this is the weird thing as well. Last piece on this one, my little bullet point. She wasn't even scheduled to be on that flight. It was an 11 o'clock flight, and in the morning, she stepped in for someone else. So just by chance, or by the positioning of God, there she was. She was the pilot, probably the best pilot in the world to be taking hold of this plane when it spins out and drops down. And she stood in on the day, and there she was. She didn't imagine it, but she came out unscathed, and the other passengers as well. So, there's a little story to think about if we feel as though we've been a dealt a cruel blow in life. I wanted to move on next to a Bible story. Do you remember the story of Samson? He's like the original Avengers. No spoilers tonight, please. Has anyone seen the movie? If you're very keen to put your hands up, it's very, very emotional. Uh, so the original Avenger was called Samson. Uh, and there was, a, there was a film last year, which I watched recently, and you forget all those little Samson stories, don't you, from uh, Sunday school, all the different things that he does. Uh, but he's listed, next, next slide, um, in Hebrews chapter 11, so towards the end of the Bible, there's a list of all the people that have acted by faith, and Samson is listed in there as one of the greats, one of the great Avengers, one of the great uh, faith growers of time. But actually, when you read his story, and if you ever watch this movie, Samson was incredibly blessed, you know, with a body like a god, according to this film, uh, and also very strong and able to be anything. When he was young, a lion attacked him, it says, and he just broke the lion's jaws and, and killed him. So Samson was very blessed, but if you watch the movie, if you read the story again, Samson was very selfish. He didn't really try to please God at all in his life. He saw things that he liked and he took them. So he saw sweet things and he had them. He saw women that he liked and he took them. He lived a very selfish life. The only times he prayed, like many people, was when he was in trouble. So when he got into trouble and he saw a gang of soldiers coming running towards him, that's when he prayed, God, deliver me, help me in my time of need. And God did help him and did it. But all through his life, really, he lived a very selfish way. There's a little verse in here. Um, but there's a little verse that I, I found because I reread this story of, of Samson. And it says this, his father and mother replied uh, to him, isn't there an acceptable woman? Because he'd gone from outside the Jewish people to, um, to a Philistine. Uh, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. And then it's the key verse. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. So even though, even though Samson was being selfish and did what he wanted and didn't really care about the rules, in fact, he had three vows that he was supposed to take from a baby, and he broke every one of them. The last was about his hair being cut, the famous one. But all of them, he broke one after the other. He didn't really follow any rules. And yet, this is the encouraging thing, isn't it? God guided him through life and kept watching over him and steered him. And his final act... Uh, was the famous one. You see his hands there with the pillars. You probably remember the story, but all the Philistines were gathered in one place, and Samson one last time said, God, would you help me? And he pushed the pillars, and the whole temple of the Philistines came down and destroyed all of their enemies. And uh, that was the end of Samson, so he died with that final prayer of his to finally serve God in what he was doing. Then the next thing that happened because Samson was the last judge, was that Saul and David come along. Remember David and David and Goliath, that story with the sling? And so 60, 70 years later, along came David. And it must have been that the people of that time would say, do you remember when Samson did that final act, when he did that final push? And, he, you know, these Philistines are beatable after all. And it was with that wave of faith that Saul and David came along to finally rule Israel and bring peace uh, across that land. But Samson, you see, wasn't really trying to please God through his life, and yet God still guided him and directed him. 
I don't know if you can see that in your life, times when you've not really cared about what God was thinking about you, but he was caring about you and he was directing your life and moving you forward. The last story from me, I'll finish with this one, is um, it was years ago, thank you, uh, when a small group of us went to Macedonia. I've never been to Macedonia before. Anyone been here? It's an unusual place to go, probably. But, um, so I went there years, years ago, and I went with a small group, and we were traveling around different churches in, in Macedonia. And um, it was Malcolm, my friend Malcolm, who was leading the trip. And he said to me, Paul, I'd like you to speak at the next church. And I felt God say to me, Paul, could you speak about the burnt stone story in Nehemiah, which I'd never spoken on before. I said, I'd much rather speak on some of the talks I've done in the past. You know, I could just pull my notes out. But anyway, so I didn't even really, I couldn't really even remember where it was. So I had to dig back and find that it was in Nehemiah chapter 4. And it talks about how the walls around Jerusalem have been knocked down. And then the only thing left to build with was these burnt stones and to put them back. And so the sermon that comes out of it really is that in life, things might have happened to us in life that make us feel as though we're not good enough to be part of the wall of Jerusalem anymore, if you see what I mean that we're not good enough to play a part in God's kingdom in that way. But God doesn't need to have an unblemished stone. He can take a stone that's not perfect, not great, not perfect, not unburnt, and he can place it in the wall and use it for his kingdom. You see what I mean? So that's what I planned to do when I got to this little church in Macedonia, to talk about that and try and make some sense. Now, not, not many of them spoke English, so it was all through an interpreter, the, the whole lot. And uh, when I arrived there, I thought, oh, I know what would be good. If, it, if I, when I arrived to this church, I could find a little burnt stone, I could hold it up, it would help the sort of communication to explain what a burnt stone is, you know, in my broken Macedonian. So when I got there, sure enough, I looked outside and straight away I found this stone that was burnt. So I thought, oh, that's, that's good, you know. So I felt as though I'd heard from God about his name, I have four, and I prepared my little talk, four, four lines. And then I got up to speak. And uh, it caused quite a commotion. They started talking amongst themselves, like, oh, what's, what's going on here? And then it came back to me. They said, oh, did you know what had happened to our church then? And so I, I, I said, no, I didn't know what had happened to the church. And then Malcolm sort of helped and then broke it. And it turns out uh, that the church that we were meeting in, this church building we were meeting in, had been burnt down like months before. And all the, all the stones scattered. And they'd had to rebuild it literally with burnt stones. Amazingly, so like they pulled it all together and they thought I was in on the act. They thought I knew about this. So, well, so I was explaining, no, it's not me, but it's really encouraging because it's a great sign that God doesn't need us to be perfect or great for us to play a part in his kingdom. We just need to be willing to be slotted in. And so that was my message, quite simple. It was a gift from God. Um, so it really is a picture for us, isn't it? We can stand in front of God and think, there's no way that I'm worthy to play a part in any of those things, or there's better churches than theirs to be leading stuff, or there's better Christians to be doing things. But actually, what Samson never did, he never brought a lead to his people. Samson was happy just to quietly do his own thing. And what the challenge of being a vocation is, that God has got great works for us planned, and we've got to be brave enough to step into them, even though we feel unworthy, fearful, we don't feel as though we're the best person for the job. God calls us to do the things that we don't feel we're with that purpose for. He takes hold of these burnt stones, these little broken stones. And if we're willing to lead, if we're willing to step up, then he'll use us well. But we can equally, like Samson did, just skulk back a little bit and not do that. So that's our challenge, is inwardly to say, God, I don't feel worthy to do the things that you're calling me to do, but... I trust you. I trust you. I'll step out and step in. When um, I called these church leaders together this week, but who am I to pull everyone together? You know, and no one could have turned up because there's many things that they've got to do, but they all turned up. So I was, I was quietly pleased. But you've got to step up and you've got to ask, haven't you, in order for anyone to respond to what you're saying. And so, and the reason why I put in the, the story about the pilot is because it's not just about church or about fulfilling your purpose within a church building or a church family, but it is about, like that pilot, she did her job, but she did it before God. 
and she brought scripture to the start of her day and in the middle of a crisis she trusted God like no one else and she saved hundreds, hundred and so people, 148 people. So each of us, wherever we find ourselves, whether it's in a church building or out doing our jobs or with our families, it's knowing that God has good works prepared for us in advance. And that although we think we're worthless, we're really not because he loves us a lot. And he's paid the price for us. I was going to finish with one last quote, which was from Whitney Houston's funeral. Um, and I use this in school a lot, um, this little quote from Pastor Winans. I don't know if you remember Whitney Houston's funeral. Uh, but he said this, I don't want you to feel that life has happened without purpose. God works all things after the counsel of his own will. You are not a mistake. You're not a mishap. God has a purpose, had a purpose before he ever created a per person. And uh, I put this up, I remember, in an assembly shortly afterwards. And it's good, isn't it? God has a purpose. God created a purpose before he created a person. That he predestined something for you to do with your life. An amazing plan for you before he even created you. Is that Ephesians 2 verse. And one girl came up to me. Uh, school girl said, sir, this is really important. They call me sir in school. It's not like, not like here. Uh, <laughs> sir, sir, this is really important. Is it, sir, you need to tell everyone this. Because a lot of us feel like we're mistakes in life. A lot of us feel like we haven't got anything to bring. But this is saying that we've got a purpose to our life. He said, she said, you need to tell everyone. I'm like, I am. That's what, you're, that's what I'm trying to do. But it doesn't matter whether we're 15 years old or 50, does it? We still feel this sense of insecurity about have I got anything to bring to the team have I got anything to bring to the party have I got anything to bring to God's kingdom and he says yes I created you for a purpose with good works prepared in advance for you to do amen <laughs>